Well, good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. If you're not enjoying that outdoor weather and feeling in life by, by the Spirit, hopefully at least um, that wonderful prelude by Marie kind of got your spirits going up a little bit as we gather together to worship today. Of course, we know that we all come together at different places in our life, but it's our hope that as we gather here and worship, we can discover how God is at work in our life. We can connect to each other through our faith, and we can take that faith and go out in the world and make a difference with it. Again, I'm Pastor Jeff. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's my delight to welcome all of us to worship, whether you're gathered here in this space with us or you're watching with us online. We are so glad that you're a part of this worship experience. We encourage you to take a minute to fill out those navy blue pew pads and let us know that you've been a part of the worship service or use the online form. It's also a great place to share any prayers you might have with us. Uh, we collect those, and then we send those out in a prayer email on Tuesday. So if you want it, to be shared with that email, there's a spot on the little blue prayer cards uh, that you'll find in the pews that you can check that says, please share this with the prayer chain. Or if you'd rather it just be something for the staff to know and pray about, you just check that box instead and uh, know that we'll be keeping you in our prayers, uh, whether it's a joy you want to celebrate or it's a concern you have. We're always glad to be in prayer with you for that. But now I invite you to stand as you feel comfortable and unable and join with our Praise team in our opening song today, Open the Eyes of My Heart. seated. And would you please be in prayer with me? Oh God, open the eyes of our hearts. Help us to see the ways that you are at work in all of our lives. God, as we gather here today, we come to you with so many struggles that we're aware of challenges that we're facing in our, our own, own lives, in the lives of people we love and care for, 
in the lives of people around the world. And we pray that you help us to see the ways that you are already work in those places. In the midst of the violence we hear about in the news, God, we pray that we might see your peace at work. In the midst of the suffering we see, people who are struggling with food insecurity or housing insecurity, people who are struggling with the stresses of life, we pray that we might see your generosity at work. And God, we pray for those people we know who are struggling with illness and grief and loss. And we pray that your healing presence might be at work in their lives. Be with them. Be with each of us who's walking alongside them in those difficult journeys. But God, we also know that you are at work in so many good and wonderful ways. As we enjoy this wonderful weather, we give thanks for what it represents, the signs of new life that come in spring, the wonder that is your creation. We give thanks as well for the joys that we have to celebrate, the ways that we can gather with friends and family for birthdays and anniversaries, the simple pleasures of community that we can experience, God. All these things we give thanks to you for, and we lift up our prayers to you this day as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now I'd invite you to stand again as you feel comfortable for our next song. It is the hymn, Gift of Love. seated unless you're a kid and then you get to come up with me today. Hey, that's some good enthusiasm for the substitute. Yeah, how's everyone doing today? Good. All right, so you got a story for us today. We're going to read from our story Bible, okay? And it's called The Road to Emmaus. Emmaus is a place, all right? So three days after Jesus died, Cleopas and his friend were slowly walking down the road to Emmaus. They were walking slowly, but they felt very sad. Why did Jesus have to die, they wondered. After a while, a stranger began to walk with them. The stranger was really Jesus, but Cleopas and his friend didn't know it. What are you talking about, the stranger asked. 
The men looked at each other. Are you the only person in town who doesn't know what just happened? They told the stranger what had happened to Jesus. Jesus was a great teacher, Cleopas said. We had hoped he was the one that God promised would save the world, but instead he died on a cross. We took Jesus' body down and put it in a tomb. This morning our friends went to the tomb, but Jesus' body was gone. They said there was an angel there. Instead, the angel told our friends, Jesus is alive, but stop being silly, the stranger said. How many times do you need to hear this? It was God's plan for Jesus to die and come alive again to save the world. By now, they were almost to Emmaus. Cleopas invited the stranger to stay for dinner. During dinner, the stranger picked up a loaf of bread, broke it and blessed it, and gave it each person a piece. All of a sudden, Cleopas and his friend recognized the stranger. It was Jesus. But then Jesus disappeared. Cleopas and his friend jumped up, ran from the room, and went to tell the rest of the disciples that Jesus was really alive. God kept another promise. All right, so we're going to do all learn all about that in Kids Connect today with Teresa and Pastor Sarah. Yeah, that's right. So, should we say a quick prayer first? All right, can we maybe pray? Dear God... We give you thanks for the ways that you show up in our lives. Help open our eyes so we can see you each and every day. Amen. All right, you guys can head down. All right, you guys got to try and match that enthusiasm with our next hymn there, Love Divine, All Love's Excelling. So let us stand and sing with a good hooray.
21. Gosh, I'm sorry. In my Bible commentary, when I read this, it stated that this was a letter that Paul had written from Rome while he was in prison waiting trial by Caesar. It was a letter of prayer and encouragement to the Ephesian community, but it also stated that it was probably passed around to all of the communities and should be remembered even when we're reading it for our community. So this is a prayer for the Ephesians. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives his name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and deep and high is the love of Christ, and to know this love surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Would you please pray with me? Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Take my lips and speak with them. Take our minds and think with them. Take our hearts and set them on fire. Amen. I want to start out by talking about what winning looks like. So I want you guys, how many of you have seen the miracle or maybe just lived through the miracle of the hockey, you know, miracle, the movie about the, the 1980 hockey team. Anyone seen the movie or maybe remembers when, you know, that happened? No judgment uh, either way if you don't have or haven't, right? I mean, this is sort of one of these quintessential moments, right, where the seemingly underdog team, you know, comes together and overcomes adversity to take on the mighty you know, opposing team and defeat them in this triumphant fashion at the end of the movie, right? It's the way we all like things to end. That's what winning should look like and feel like. But of course, that may be what it should look like and feel like, but we kind of know in reality it doesn't always happen that way, right? I mean, if you, if you were following the women's basketball tournament uh, for this last season here. Um, there was this sense that wouldn't it be great if Iowa and Caitlin Clark could go all the way to the finals and then they would win and, and Caitlin Clark, who's had this fantastic career, would go out as a national champion, right? I mean, that's the way Hollywood would want it to happen. Didn't really work that way, did it? Good for South Carolina, but not so good for, for Iowa fans. And of course, many of us in Minnesota, especially if you're a fan of men's teams in Minnesota, aren't quite sure what this winning thing is all about anyway, right? <laughs> like, do we really need to win a national championship in anything? Yes, we do. Okay. <laughs> I will certainly uh, acknowledge that as I was writing this sermon this week, I was coming off of a less than stellar performance in fencing uh, last Sunday and uh, had a tournament yesterday and I was thinking, boy, when I'm writing this sermon, I'm not sure about this winning thing, but I thought it'd be kind of ironic if, you know, then on Saturday I went out and I had a great tournament and I could show you guys all my medals that I won. Well, here they are. <laughs> I, I like to say I take the pastoral approach to, to winning when it comes to fencing. I let somebody else do it. Uh, it's just very large-hearted of me uh, to, to, to empower others to have that opportunity rather than hogging it all for myself. Now, you're wondering, what is it about winning that connects to this letter to the Ephesians? But I think this letter, in part, is actually all about our expectations around what winning looks like versus what we should expect winning to be, 
when it comes to our life of faith. Because again, when we think about what winning looks like, it's triumphant, it's wonderful, we're on top, it's great, right? But if you think about that early church, that wasn't their experience of winning. After all, they followed a leader who had died on the cross, and they were getting this letter from another leader, Paul, who was in prison in Rome. So when you're hearing this opposition, what Paul is kind of talking about is you may think you know what winning looks like. It's Rome. It's power and success and control. But we in the faith are meant to see winning in a different way. Paul is setting up this opposition between our faith and the world, and Rome, and what it looks like. And we see that working in a number of ways. One is this idea of who reigns supreme. Because at that time in the Mediterranean, when you thought of who reigned supreme, it was Rome. They conquered everyone. They were everywhere. And then they got there, they built big, powerful buildings, often these seemingly temple-like buildings to Caesar. That lift it up so you say, hey, look, we've got Caesar, and this is what it looks like. And by contrast, Christians didn't really have those kind of buildings at that time. Instead, they were meeting in, in small houses and, and other places. The closest they might have to that kind of building was the temple in Jerusalem, and that got destroyed by the Romans. So, again, there's this sense of if that's what you're looking for winning to look like. Rome had it and the church didn't. But what we're being asked to remember, what Paul wants us to see, is that winning looks different. And we have a choice on how we look for things. Do we place our dependence on these powers of the world, or replace them somewhere else. And what we're asked to do from this letter is to place those power in two things, God and love. Because after all, we're reminded at the beginning, this is the God who is the God of all families of the earth, which is one translation. Others talk about God the Father. And what's interesting when you use that God the Father of all the families language is again you see an opposition to Rome because all the coinage had the picture of the emperor and the word father. The emperor was the father. And so in some ways there's a theological claim. No matter who you think you're following, whatever gods you think you're following, the real God, our God, is over all of that. Paul is saying it may feel like there's these other powers in the world, but the real power in the world comes from God. And we can root and ground our faith. We can have our faith have its foundations in what? We can have it in these buildings. Or we can root and ground our faith in love. Again, there's this tension between these two. You know, we can know the value of rooting and grounding our faith in buildings because this is just something that is deep in our culture. And it's not just unique to, to our culture here in the United States. It was, again, very prevalent in that culture in the Mediterranean. It's something that we see in lots of places. When I was over in Europe a few years ago, I remember I was touring Vienna and, and was pointed out that there was this monument that had been built and it was built very quickly by the Soviets when they liberated, well, as we might say, liberated Vienna from the Germans. I'm sure some of the other people didn't feel it that way. And the Soviets built this statue to kind of remind everyone who's in control here. Who won? What, you know, where is the power lie? And we've done this too. 
You know, when we, when we think about our seats of government, what do we do for them? Do we have little, you know, small office buildings somewhere? Or do we have big buildings that we can point to and go, there, that's the capital, that's the heart, right? And certainly we've done this with churches as well. Big physical buildings to remind everyone, this is where the power is. This is where it is. But I think in this letter... We're sort of challenged on that. Do we want to put our trust in these physical powers? Or should we instead put our trust in this love? Because the life of faith isn't going to be about winning. This story that is kind of playing out in the background of this letter to the Ephesians is Paul's life, right? Paul is captive in Rome, and will die in captivity. There's no miracle ending to this story where Paul is set free, having converted the Romans, and, you know, all of a sudden Christianity rules over all the world or something, or Paul just gets out and can have a nice, quiet end of his life. The Christian faith can be about suffering and dying. It's not about winning all the time. And sometimes we like to make it out that way. Sometimes it's nice to think that way, right? That if we just lead a good and faithful life, we'll be rewarded. Sounds like a nice sermon, right? <laughs> but I think we shouldn't expect that reward to be something we experience here. What we're taught in this story is that that suffering may be a part of it. What we're meant to do is root and ground ourselves in love. And we know that that is hard. I can imagine it was hard for Paul and, and the early Christians to love the Romans, right? These are the occupying powers that are forcing and creating this tension and, and imprisoning and everything, right? What does it mean to be rooted and grounded in love where we say we're going to love even though we're not on top, even though we're not in control, even though we're not winning? But Paul wants us to see that that love is there. Paul also wants us to see that that love is meant to be broad and inclusive. Because another part of the argument that Paul is making in this letter is this idea that this love is for everyone. The first two chapters really set this up of, you know, it used to be that we thought that God just loved the Jews, but actually God loves the Gentiles too. And Paul is telling them the good news that whoever you are, God loves you. So even when we hear in that that claim I talked about of, you know, the God, the, the overall families of the earth is also reminded that it is God for everyone. All of us. And that, too, can be challenging and hard because most of us like God for ourselves when it gets deep down to it. I think it's kind of like we think about our parents. Anyone ever had that dynamic where you kind of were like, I wish my parents would spend more time with me and less time with another sibling? If you're an only child, don't worry, they spend all the time with you, right? <laughs> but we've seen that, and we talk about that dynamic, right? I mean, it's one of those things you learn in early childhood development class of like, okay, once you have a second kid, that first kid will start to do this and that to get attention again. We want that attention for ourselves. Because again... We want to be the one on top. We want to be winning. It's very fundamental to who we are. And yet we're challenged in our faith to realize that winning isn't everything. What really matters is love. I mean, we hear that echoed in that song, Gift of Love, we sang earlier, right? We can win, but if we have not love, what does it really mean? We need to 
to root and ground ourselves in love. We need to make that our foundation. So how do we do that in a world where winning is kind of everything? I mean, it isn't and it is, right? Like, we could say, oh, yeah, if you don't care about sports, then what is it really about winning? Except most of us want to be right. We certainly don't want someone else who we think is wrong to kind of be right. And most of us, maybe if we don't say, I don't need to be a millionaire, we still want to have enough, right? Like, we want to, to have our needs taken care of. But is that? what it's really about? Or is it about something more? Is it about that love that's inclusive of everyone and making sure everyone has enough and making sure everyone is cared for? It's not just about do we have enough, are we cared for? It's about everyone. Now, rooting and grounding ourselves in that love is hard, but I think that is why we are here now. Because we know that through acts like worship, we can remind ourselves that we're a part of something greater than ourselves, right? We gather in worship with other people so we can see that broadness of God's love. We gather in worship to worship God so we can be reminded who it is who really wins, who's really in control. But we also come to equip ourselves for the challenges of a life of faith. Because it's not always going to be easy. It's not as simple as, hey, if you just pray and it'll all work out the way you want it. In some way, what I hear in this letter is a reminder that it's beyond our comprehension, right? We won't understand it. It doesn't make sense. One of the powerful things to me about faith is it doesn't have to make sense, which is comforting to me who likes to try and figure everything out. Because there's a lot I can't figure out. There's a lot I can't understand or know. And instead... We're reminded to have that faith in a God who is greater than us, who understands more than us, who loves deeper than us and broader than us and higher than us. All of this greatness that we hear in this passage. So part of what we do is just keep coming back to that. To remember not only are we loved, but all of us are loved. God's love is for all of us. And it's not going to end in the triumphant way we want it to end. It's going to end in a triumphant way for all of us, which will look different than what we can understand or imagine. But in the end... To me, that is our faith as an Easter people. We don't understand what really goes on in the resurrection of Christ, right? We can try and think about it and rationalize it and, and figure it all out, but in the end, we don't understand. Nor do we really understand what goes on in this resurrection that is promised to all of us. If you've got it all figured out, then talk to me and we'll let you run a small Sunday school class or something on it to explain it. We don't really know what is next. But our faith is in a God who overcomes losing. Overcomes death on a cross. Overcomes losing in all the ways that we might understand it. And it still ends up triumphant. And our hope, our faith, is that we too will find that end for ourselves. No matter how hard it is along the way, no matter how much we might struggle or the struggles we might see in the world, we know that God's love is at work. We just need to root 
and ground ourselves in that love too. And that will equip us for the challenges we face as individuals, for the challenges we face as a community, for the challenges we face as a world. Because God loves all of us. And that will give us the strength for whatever lies ahead, whether it's winning or it's losing. Amen. Well, we come now to our time of offering, and as the screen reminds us, our act of worship is our offering. It is one of the ways that we surrender some of what we have to be a part of something greater. We don't do it because we'll get something from it. We do it because of what we hope it will do for others. It's a part of how we seek through our gifts, whether it's the financial contributions that we give or it's our gifts that we share, the ways that we live out love in our lives, all of this is part of how we seek to be a part of God's work in the world. So I invite the ushers to collect the offering this morning as the choir sings for us. Would you join me now in our prayer of thanksgiving? God of grace, you are the source of all we have gained, but your greatest gift is the new life we receive in Christ. 
We offer these gifts as signs of our commitment to claim Christ's resurrection as your gift, for you have claimed us in his life. Amen. Well, as we prepare to go forth into the world, I want to lift up a few ministry opportunities we have for you. First of all, it is a reminder that today is the last day for the pr spring plant sale that we do to support Reclaim and its uh, ministries. Um, there are order forms out um, on the Welcome Center there. If you'd like to fill out a paper copy and turn that right back in, you're welcome to do that. You can also fill it out and online, but again, you need to do that today because we'll be compiling the order um, this week and we need that information in. If you do have any questions about it, I'm su sure Judy Judy would be happy to answer them. Um, as I th know she said on, in past weeks, again, this is an important way that we raise funds to support Reclaim, which does a lot of great work for um, LGBTQ youth um, and provide support for them. So it's one of the ways that we try to live out that core value of our congregation. Another way that we try to live out our inclusive values is going to come up next week as we're celebrating a reconciling Sunday here at Faith. And so we're going to be joined by Matt Llewellyn Otten from Out Front, who's going to be speaking at Faith Forum and then be giving the message uh, during the sermon time here in the worship. So we really hope you can come and and hear that great message that they have for us. I think it'll be a, a wonderful um, uh, Sunday of celebration. We've had a whole team putting together the worship service, so that'll be fun too. Um, encourage you to come and be, a, you should come every week, <laughs> obviously. But if for some reason you were debating if this was a week to skip, that was this week when I was talking. <laughs> so you blew it, and you got to come next week too. So that's just going to be a, a great thing. Um, also want to lift up, uh, there's a number of other uh, things going on. We've got the J Jerry Hansen Memorial Scholarship. If that's something that uh, would apply to you or some opportunities that are going on. But I also wanted to lift up another um, cool thing that we're doing is uh, the Emma Norton is uh, restarting their birthday celebrations that they do at their housing uh, facility for people. And uh, I think we get to be the first group doing the birthday celebration at their new facility that is um, now open, the Restoring Waters facility that we as a lot of, along with so many other congregations around the, the state have been working to help uh, support. So if you want to be a help, help out of that birth cel birthday celebration, it's Tuesday, April 30th at 1 p.m. Um, and again, uh, there's lots of ways to participate in that. Um, but if that interests you, uh, Talk to us, and we'll let you know how to get involved more with that. But that's just a, a great thing. I also wanted to just take a moment to, to lift up uh, one of the things that I did this last week uh, was attend the McVeigh uh, dinner, recognizing 20 years uh, that the McVeigh um, program has been going. This is a program that uh, connects um, children, or really middle school youth, um, in various schools in the St. Paul area. Uh, with um, kids, college kids, um, to in sort of a kind of a hangout slash uh, support system. They get together after school. Um, I think it's three times a week. It's a really great program. Um, if you want to know more about that, you should really talk to my mom because uh, she was <laughs> at Hamlin when they got it started. But what we do as a partner congregation is we just provide snacks. And it doesn't seem like a whole lot. But some of you are great in providing these snacks, but you, you know as a kid, when you get done with a hard day at school and you're going to get ready to hang out, snacks always make it a lot more fun. And it's a gr it was really cool to hear the stories of what this program does uh, for the middle schoolers who experience someone older than them, often someone who looks more like them. There's a lot of focus around diversity, and so there was a lot of effort made to pair um, these kids who are in the diverse schools that we have in St. Paul with um, diverse kids coming from Hamlin to see that college is attainable. We heard stories of a lot of first generation college students who had seen that through McVeigh, that this was possible. And so we give these snacks and we may not think anything of them other than we bring them, we drop them off and, and we don't know where they go, but I just wanted us to hear 
part of what our contributions do. One of the ways that we're just a small part, the real work is done by other people, but we're just a small part of, of a very important program that's doing good work. And so I wanted to lift that up as well. But now I would invite you to stand as you feel comfortable and are able for our closing song, Amazing Grace and Grace Alone. Normally, we try to work three or four weeks at least out ahead on our hymns. And so when I was getting ready for Guyon vacation after Easter and everything, I tried to make sure I had all the hymns picked out through Pentecost so that I could go on vacation. And, and then I came back and looked, and somehow I didn't have a closing hymn for this week. Picked all the other hymns. Like, we were good for everything else. Somehow I missed that I forgot a closing hymn this week. And so I quickly messaged... Uh, Gene and, and Neil to say, hey, does the band have something that would be good as a closing song? Because I'm just not quite sure what. And Neil suggested 
uh, this, this song here, and I just thought it nailed it for me because it reminds us, through amazing grace, we start out needing grace. And that grace meets us in those broken moments in our life. But it's not like then we're good on our own. Once we've gotten that grace, check that box, we can go on and we're good on our own. What do we need to go forth? We still need grace. We need it to begin with. We need it to end with. We need it to surround us all. So let us go forth with that grace that surrounds each and every one of us in our lives and let us go forth and share that grace with a world that needs God's grace almost as much as we do. Amen. Forgiveness and grace, put your trust in his name, put your faith in his word. There is healing for you in his hands. There is healing in his hands. There is strength for today. There is hope for the world. Forgiveness and grace, put your trust in his name, put your faith in his word. There is healing for you in his hands. and grace. Put your trust in his name. Put your faith in his word. There is healing for you in his hands. He will never leave you alone. He's promised to guide you each step of the way. I know what he's promised he'll do. I see my God answer and his word Put your 